Did y'all have a good evening? As long as you had air conditioning, you had a good evening. Praise the Lord. I told Brother Kyle, he said he's preaching on now. I said, well, this is a timely message because when it's this hot, it's, uh, you don't want to go there. Amen. So uh, let's start off singing with a hymn number 135, Nothing But the Blood. All four stands. Seen. <coughs> the hymn number 483, 483, Footsteps of Jesus.
This message was about hell. Three points I never heard. Hell's real. Hell's real hot. Hell's real hot a long time. <laughs> never forget that, brother. But you know, we can avoid going to hell. God's made a way for us to avoid hell all day. It's called Jesus. And if there's one thing that I hope that you get from the message of our song that we sing tonight, is ask people, do you know my Jesus? He's the one that wants to save you from that place called hate. He wants to lead you to a place that's called abundant life, where we can let release all these troubles and trials as we're living. We don't have to just wait till we go to heaven. We can live and live abundantly, live blessed, and we take that's the Jesus.
Wayne, the Cindy, we appreciate it. Uh, that is the most important question, do you know? I have been for this whole week thinking in my mind about this message. And it, it is a message about hell, but it's a, it's a message that answers some questions, shall we say, about uh, location, and time periods, and is there a difference between this, this hell and that hell? And, and uh, the answer to all of that is yes. And so, you know, as a, as a young person, I can remember I mean, you know, whenever I was young, I didn't, I didn't read the Bible much, to be honest with you, and uh, just when I had to, y'all get that? Some of y'all didn't get it. But uh, older I got, and listening to different messages, you start putting things together. And you start hearing this part, that part, and you say, well, I don't quite understand how that fits together. And I can remember some of the earliest messages uh, I remember. I remember when I was 13 years old. That, that was actually in that revival that I that I came forward publicly uh, with my salvation there at um, there at Cherry Ridge Baptist Church there in Baxter. But Brother J. Harold Smith was there at the revival, and I remember him preaching a message that week on on uh, the Lake of Fire, and listening to it, the Great White Throne Judgment, things of this nature. I'm thinking. Well, all them folks that are there being judged, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, weren't they already in hell? And the answer to that is yes. So if you would turn your Bible tonight, and you can go ahead and you see on the screen there, we have three words. We have the Old Testament word for hell, Sheol. And this can, of course, this can refer to, to, to hell, but in your Bible you just you just have it translated hell, but typically that's the grave. But the grave is also referred to in different passages in a sense of, shall we say, eternal separation. And uh, so that leads us to the next word, okay, of, of, of Hades, and then of course again, uh, Hades is, is the current hell. Current hell. That's that's confusing. Well, just hold on to your horses, and let's uh, we'll have you turn to the Book of Luke, chapter sixteen. If you don't know already, you will as soon as you get there. This will immediately resonate with you. You say, "Well, I know, I know what this is," and we can kind of pick up there in our, in our teaching tonight. We want to look at paradise, Abraham's bosom. And then, of course, what is referred to as hell, what we know of is hell. As you're turning there to Luke 16, um, we're going we're to start along there about verse number 19. This is referred to as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. It's, it's often referred to as a parable, but no other parable are there, are there proper names used. And then, of course, the doctrine that's here all describes things as described elsewhere in Scripture. We're going to look at just a, some snippets here, there, and yonder as we move along. Uh, but before we start our reading, I do want to, in your mind, I want you to, to, to think, be thinking of this. Be aware um, of something that, that occurs, again, chronologically after where we are right now in Luke 16. Okay? But in chapter 23 there, when, when Christ is hanging on the cross with the two thieves, you'll remember he says to one of the thieves, he says what? He says, this day thou shalt be with me in where? Paradise. Paradise. We're going to look at that here as this, as this moves forward um, um, in, in, a, in, shall we say, a theological lesson, a look tonight. But in the parable of rich man and Lazarus, in Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse number 19, it says, There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day, he lived in luxury. So verse 20 says, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of souls, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, more of the dogs came and licked his souls. 
It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. This is the same thing as paradise. But then we see the next phrase. It says, and the rich man also died and was buried. Now, this really doesn't have anything to, 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 to do with what we're studying tonight, but it is significant in, in, in our, at least in the passage, and in principle and theologically. We see that the beggar, we know his name, and it is what? Lazarus. Lazarus. The rich man is simply referred to as the rich man, all right, and he's never named. Have you ever thought about that? Why is he not named here? I'll tell you why he's not named here. It's because of what Christ says in Matthew chapter 7 when he says, I never knew you. Okay? And that's the significance there in that point. As we turn to verse number 23, we begin now to look at, shall we say, the, 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 the crux of what I want to look tonight. It says, in hell, okay, this is Hades, he lift up his eyes, this is the rich man, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, when it says afar off here, you know, we need to understand, he is not looking from hell in the earth, center of the earth, up into the what Paul refers in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as the second heaven. He's looking across. Okay. Originally, hell, as we see it here in this passage, had what? It had two compartments. Two compartments. And uh, I was thinking about this as I was driving up here tonight and uh, in, 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 in making this illustration. Uh, I just wanted, was thinking about the folks that were sitting in one section looking at the folks in the other section and looking across the aisle there, and you're divided by something. Now, I'm not going to say who's who. Okay. I'm, I'm glad y'all took that in the spirit which it was given. But the point of the matter is, in the two compartments, they were able to look across. Okay, obviously, the rich man in hell, in Hades, is looking across that gulf. We'll see him actually described here in just a moment. Okay, and he's able to see those that were what that are not suffering. Okay, now we need to understand something. Let's let's make sure we clear the air on this. Okay. Because you, you see this kind of stuff all the time and people make these references and 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 I'm not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill, but it's important that we be that we be scripturally sound. But we need to understand that the people that are in heaven are not looking down watching you. Amen. Everybody understand that? They are not. Nowhere in scriptures that ever talked about. They are not looking at you. And the people that are in hell cannot look up to heaven. Okay, and see what's going on up. None of that stuff, kind of stuff exists. All right, so let's, let's, let's be cautious in those things. All right, so continuing here, verse 24, Lazarus, the, the rich man says, and he cried and said, Father Abraham. Okay, you say, well, he is referring to a specific individual. Who is he referring to? Abraham. Okay, the Old Testament saints. At this time period, and I'm getting to that in just a minute, this is where they were in paradise. They're in that compartment there. Again, there's no suffering there in these, in these type things, but of course it isn't heaven either. All right? But this, this existed up until, and just hold on, we'll get to that. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water. And cold my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good thing, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Then here's his reply. He says, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot nor would they. Neither can they pass to us, which they all would. I'm just summarizing. That would come from thence. All right. So we're looking at this point at the two separate compartments, all right? The, the, there, the, the, this is, this, the, there in what is described as or what is named as Hades, all right? And so you say, well, is it 
still present today, half of it. I'll let that sink in just a minute. Only one compartment is still there today. One of them, the other of it, has been emptied. Okay. You say, explain that. Well, we've already started the explanation in this. Christ, whenever they hang, he hang on the cross there, told the one that was before him that by faith had received him, again, told him, says, Thou shalt be with me today in, in paradise. When Christ died on the cross, okay, when he gave up the ghost in a sense, okay, his spirit did not stay with him on the cross. Everybody get that part? It did not stay with him when he was in the tomb. He left and went somewhere else. So we're getting to the next part of this. Let me have you turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now before I start into this process of, of, of where I'm going now through these next, we're going to look at 1 Peter 3, uh, 2 Peter 2, and then Ephesians 4. Before I start into this, okay, we're going to dovetail into something else. Something else that I don't have time tonight, and I don't want me to get more confused, and I certainly don't want you to get more confused. But we're going to have um, here references to the spirits that are in prison. Okay? And I am going to mention to those about those briefly, but I'm not going to get in depth. We will do that next Sunday night. Who are these spirits? How did they get there? Why are they there? How long will they be there? We'll answer all those questions next week. So how do you like me teasing next Sunday night's message? First Peter chapter 3. Y'all are all turned there and I'm not yet. Verse 19. <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to start at verse 18 and kind of, kind of move through 1 Peter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also hath suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Okay. So we're, we're, we're all aware of everything about that on the cross, the crucifixion. Okay. That he might bring to us God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. Then we move to verse 19. It says, By which also, in other words, his spirit went, traveled, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, let me make sure we understand the word preached. He did not go somewhere and present the gospel. That is not what this word means. He mean, It means to proclaim. Okay. One of the best ways to explain this word, we will see this, 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 this terminology um, and it used quite a bit when we, at some point, when we get to the book of Esther. So y'all just remember this. But if you'll remember your old movies, okay, and at this point I'm talking about, I'm talking about stuff back in the medieval days, okay, when you got the knights riding around on the horses, you know, you got Errol Flynn with all of his stuff on and he's doing his sword fight, and that's what I'm talking about. But if you remember during that time period, and from your school days, you'll remember these type things, that they had what was called a town crier. Okay? They didn't have newspapers as such. Okay? They didn't have internet or the phone or none of this other kind of stuff. Okay? Um, they might have had some smoke signals, I don't even know. All right? But they would literally have a rider that once a proclamation was made, shall we say, by the government or by the mayor of that town or whatever the case may be, okay, they wanted, they would tack it up. You, you've seen them as they tacked up the thing on Robin Hood. They put the stuff up on the wall and all yada, yada, yada. Well, then they had to go out and they had to let everybody know. So the town crier would go to the populated areas, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. And then he would make the announcement, okay, of whatever it was. Okay. This word preach here, and he preached unto the spirits in prison, you need to think of it along those lines. It's about going and making a official proclamation. Okay. Now I'm gonna hold on that. We'll come back in just a minute. All right. But then we'll read verse number 20. All right. Preached unto the spirits in prison, and then we'll get into this next part next week. 
which sometime or were formerly at, a, a, at an earlier time disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. So you're getting an idea there. While the ark was preparing, where in few that is eight souls were saved by water. We'll get to those next week. The main thing we need to see out of this is verse number 19 as he goes and he makes Christ, makes this proclamation. Now we need to make sure we understand where he's standing when he makes it. Okay? He is not in hell. Okay? You hear this kind of mass circulating every once in a while and quite frankly mainly from charismatic preachers. Okay? But he did not go to hell. What he did do was go to paradise. There he took with him the thief on the cross, where he should go, he took him to there, and then standing on that side of the gulf, then proclaimed to those on the other side, which would have been those that were in hell, but also to these spirits, demons, okay, that what? Death has been defeated. That through the blood of Jesus Christ, by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that through that crucifixion that you have, in other words, your revolt, everything that you followed Satan to do has been defeated. And that was well, that, that is the message of the proclamation. Because what? Because it's official. It's done. You've heard the old song, and I don't know which one it was, some of you would, would know it immediately. But there's a, there's a popular song that death died at the cross. Okay? And it did. You say, but people die every day. Well, listen, for those standing on this side, for those that have, what? Sought forgiveness through the blood of the Lamb, it's only a short, short, short journey when we close our eyes to the arms of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I was talking to, uh, talking, I was texting back and forth with a friend of mine up in Virginia last night. He, uh, his mom has been <clears throat> battling a severe, severe disease for seven years. And and they knew that it was very, very, very close. And, and we had texted a little bit back and forth last night. And, and uh, so the first thing I got this morning is I checked my messages and sure enough she had passed away during the night. Most here, if not all, will understand this. We certainly do not want to see our loved ones struggle or suffer in those stages. Okay? And they then, there's, there's nothing wrong with it, but they have been praying that God take her and let it be easy with no problems whatsoever. And of course, during the night, she slipped away to the other side. She never jerked in bed. She never moved. It was as if though was that in her sleep that she woke up on the other side. That's exactly what happened. And so we understand that it's not far to the other side. But quite frankly, we can't get there from here. Okay? God has to take us there. We see in this parable, I'm using that, that term, okay, um, the angels took Lazarus to, to, the, to the throne. But here, we see here, first of all, that Christ, from paradise, that he preached to the spirits that were in prison. Proclaim. Now go quickly to 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm just going to read one verse. This, this feeds into what I just told you. Okay. But really the only reason I'm reading it Again, this is just to give background, okay, to that gulf and to the, the Hades side, okay? So verse number four, 2 Peter chapter two, verse number four. This has to do with those that are, that are chained and chained in darkness, chained spirit. And there's a particular word for the, for the actual area that they're in and they all get to that next week. Verse 4 says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, okay, but cast them down to hell, okay, underline that word hell, remember that for next week. Okay, it's not one of the words that were on the screen earlier. This is not Sheol. This is not Hades. 
And this is not Gehenna. It says, down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Okay. Now, this has nothing to do, shall we say, with Abraham's bosom, but just in the sense of, of again, another verse that speaks of that area that God, is, that Christ is proclaiming to. Now go to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. A couple verses there. Then we'll go right to the book of Revelation. <laughs> Beginning into in uh, verse number 8. Ephesians 4, 8. Wherefore he saith, when he, this is Christ, ascendeth up on High, ascendeth up on high, and then we see the next phrase. When he ascended from paradise, okay, he did not, and I'm breaking in here in my reading of the scripture, but he did not leave them behind. Okay? He emptied that compartment. Here we go. He led captivity captive. Okay. Understand this. Old Testament saints, they were not being punished by being kept there, okay? But it was, they were awaiting the resurrection, or shall we say they were ready for, again, and that's when all of this occurred at that moment, okay? When Christ left, okay, when he died, put in the grave, this, that, and other, he went down, but as he was being resurrected from this earth, okay, at that moment, his feet, and everybody else in paradise were leaving to go to heaven. Boom. Right then and there. It says, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now, gave gifts unto men is, is a, has nothing to do with him giving them stuff once they get to heaven. That has to do with the spiritual gifts that he gave here on this earth. Okay. Now, verse 9 says, now that he ascended. What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might feel or fulfill all things. Okay. Now let's go to the book of Revelation chapter 20. So as a recap, as you're turning there and in your mind getting things set, remember that up until, up until, Christ died on the cross, every person that died prior to that, that was saved, went to be in paradise. When Christ left paradise and went to heaven, okay, from that time period on, there's been nobody there. Okay, it's empty. The other side of hell is still there for now. Revelation chapter 20. We know this passage. We've uh, looked at it ourselves a couple of different times. You certainly many times in your studies and your reading. But this is the this is the great white throne judgment. Okay. I've given you a, a time period of when the first started and the first ended. But this, so this will happen, okay? So um, um, after the end of the millennial reign of Christ, at the end of the thousand year reign, this is when the great white throne takes place. Chapter 20, we see here, first of all, in verse number 10, okay? Well, as we, as we, turn, we turn back even, even further than that into chapter 19, um, in the chapter 19, verse number 20, we see that the, 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 the Antichrist and the false prophet will be the first two that, that's put there. Okay? So then we turn in chapter 20, all the way to verse number 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. Okay? This is Gehenna. All right. This is what the, 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 the word, this is the lake of fire, but it's used by a Greek word, Gehenna. Gehenna was a trash dump outside of Jerusalem. 
This is the word that Christ uses for hell, okay, in, in his passages as he speaks of the future. This is where the worm dieth not. Now, some of the things I'm fixing to say to you may seem a little gross, but Christ said them, so I guess it's okay if I do. But when he talks about the worm that dieth not, we need to understand that in Guiana, all right, that this is, this is the, the trash dump outside of Jerusalem where everything was taken. When the roads would be cleared inside the city and all the animals that died overnight, they were all taken and just cast out and thrown into this valley. Whenever people died that had no money, okay, this is where they were taken. Right? This would have been where Lazarus, his body, in all likelihood was taken and cast. Okay? And so when something dies, you have something crawling on it. Everybody, we got that? Yeah. And then we, we, we read about this stench and this smell, and it never, it never quits. You know, I don't know if any of you have ever been. I've been to two different places where there used to be a landfill, and you can still smell it. Right. You can still smell it. Okay? And some of those things are, are, are described here. But the lake of fire, this is the eternal hell. Every single soul okay, that, that, that did not receive Christ during, the, during their lifetime, Every single one of them will be resurrected. This is the general resurrection, okay? And, and so we're going to, let's read through that now in, in chapter 20, beginning in verse 11. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. Okay, this is everybody. This is billions of people. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their words. And the sea gave up, her, gave up the dead. Every person that's ever, ever died on the sea through wars, drowning, sinkings, whatever the case may be, their body would resurrect with their spirit. It will be there at the great white throne. And we'll have something else to say about that here in just a few moments. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Verse 15 says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this that was being referred to here, the lake of fire, is the eternal hell. Okay? Nobody's in it yet. There are no people in it yet. There will be at least 1,007 years, and I'm talking about by the tick of the clock, minimum before any soul enters that place. But that is where the loss will spend all eternity. Um, we'll give you one more thing out of the book of Revelation um, since we're, we're on this subject. Chapter 22. This is something that, 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 that people just, it, it makes sense as soon as you hear it, but you just something that you just don't really maybe not think about. You and I, Christians, one of the, shall we say, one of the, one of the, one of the things that, that we're going to be blessed with is a new body. Amen. Now, for the younger ones that are in here, that may not be a big deal. Madison. I'm picking at her because I couldn't remember her name this morning, so I've said it three times today, so I'm trying to remember. <laughs> now, I'm not picking on Madison right now, but to her, that's not as big a deal as it is to some of you. Y'all got what I mean? And as you grow older, it gets to be a bigger deal. Am I right? Amen. We know that God promised us. And not only does he just promise, we know this is true, we know it's going to happen, that there's coming a time when we'll never hurt again. Amen. Ever. Ever. Okay? We'll have new bodies, glorified bodies. We read in the New Testament, we see that in Christ, with his glorified body, okay, able to walk through walls, okay, all these type things, be able to travel, you know, great distances at the blink of an eye. Hey, I got one uh, ace in the hole here. Christ ate fish in his glorified body. Brother Jim just smacked his lips back there. Amen. You know, I, 
I don't know why, but I just know it says it's happened. Okay? So that means we'll have the same type body he has. There'll be one thing missing on us that he has. Who's going to say it first? Say it out loud. Nail scar hands. He'll have those nail scar hands for all eternity. Okay. But now I've had you turn to this passage here in Revelation chapter 22, verse 11. He that is unjust, okay, that's the lost. That's a reference to the lost. Let him be unjust still. Now, the word still here, we see this often in the English. We, in our mind, grasp that word, and well, we know what that means. Well, no, we don't. This is one of those words that's, that's, that's not translated, shall we say, in the sense of the Greek word, but it means it means more or you'll, you'll get it forever more. Okay. So let me read the next part. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still or forever more. So we go first from those that are lost. Then there's a change to those to, to, to those that are in Christ. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still or forevermore. And he that is holy, let him be holy still or forevermore. Now, understand that the connotation is he that is righteous, let him be righteous still forevermore. That's a, that's a reference to ongoing continuing spiritual growth for all eternity. Y'all hear what I just said? That means that the stake is going to get bigger the longer you're there. Y'all can't, John, did you? You're staring up here. Did you not catch that? Hey, we see this all through Scripture. Heaven gets better and better and better and better and better and nothing ever gets on you. Amen. What about the other side? Filthy forevermore. Let's look at, first of all, let's look at it in the sense of, of, of the body that they have at the time of death. You and I have the, have the promise of a, of a new body, a glorified body. Amen. Those that go to hell will have a glorified body in the only in the sense that it will never burn up. Okay. But let's say that, the, and, and I'm just trying to describe this, but let's say a person dies having rejected Jesus Christ and they're disfigured passage teaches him that they will, they will get a new body. They will continue in hell forever, ever, and ever, and ever, and ever with that same body. And again, a hatred for it. Their wickedness, the hate within them, they will suffer from the fire, eternal fire, but they will also suffer from an eternal hatred within them. Okay. We already know this. You, you, but there'll be no parties in heaven. There'll be no getting, um, excuse me, in hell. There'll be no, well, we'll just kind of get together and pass time as it goes by. That ain't happening. Okay. Hell is eternal forever and ever and ever for all eternity. That's the kind of stuff that makes your head hurt. Punishment. Hell is a very real place. That's right. I wanted to, to, to give this to you tonight, to give you some give you some, some, some groundwork here theologically of the hell that's there now, how it has changed to a degree that certainly will change more in the future. And all that stuff is good to know. We should know it. But the most important thing is, is that you and I know people by name that are going to spend eternity. We have relatives, people that we know by name that will spend eternity there. I'm going to tell you a brief story that 
I still hadn't got over after nearly 15 years. The church that I was at there in Arkansas, there was a couple that lived down the road in the church. Good folks. Nice. Give you a shirt off his back. Just all, you know, the stuff that you hear about everybody. He's lost. Had made it known, telling us that he knew he was lost. We had gone down to visit him, I don't know how many times, for the years. Uh, over and over and over. So, one of my men at the church, we had been talking and praying about different ones. Let's, let's, let's go see souls. So we did. So we got there, and, and uh, as I started talking, and the guy that was with him, we had kind of been talking back and forth, and he got still, and I, I, knew, I knew by his posture, we had been several times different place. I knew he was praying. So I got to talking a little bit, and I led into the gospel, and, and uh, I, I had a couple of tracks in my hand that I was going to leave them. Um, but I was talking with him about the gospel, and I just just a few words in, I saw, I watched with my eyes, I watched the wife. You could, you could tell emotionally that, 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 that God was gripping her heart, dealing with her in a major way. Amen. And so the husband, he was he was sitting over there in his chair. She was sitting on the end, other end of the couch where I was. Okay. The guy, the guy that was with was over here. Okay. And so I'm watching both their faces as I'm going through this, and I'm watching her, and I can see that yearning for them. And so I get all the way through. And so I looked at her, and I said, Miss So-and-so, I said, would you like to, and I didn't get to say another word. The husband broke in then and said, you know what? This is something that we'll have to think about and talk about. We appreciate you coming, and bye-bye. And I watched the countenance on her face change from a per from a hopeful to something you might use the term shattered. We went back into that home a number of times after that before I left and never got anywhere. It was though like God shut the door. Certainly praying that maybe another time. One more. Way back years ago, we got a phone call. A lady in our church uh, that had been visiting her husband had, had uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it, it's, 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 it's um, Hodgkin's lymphoma, am I saying that right? He was in the, in the veterans hospital a little while. So, went up there, knew that it was not good. Went up there to, to, to see them. And, uh, the first time that I saw him, he was in, he was in pretty bad shape. He, he, he couldn't, even, couldn't even really carry on a conversation or him even acknowledge. Well, so I just, you know, prayed with him, whatever, went on left, went on home. Very soon, within that week, went back up there and he was able to talk to me and so started sharing the gospel um, with him and she had visited our church some this that and other I didn't know exactly where she stood at that time started talking with him and uh, sharing the gospel and, 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 and as we got through to the end they just just no response no whatsoever just Or the end of the week, he was dead. And after a few days, after doing doing that funeral, after a few days, I went and talked to the wife. You know, this is this is one of the oddest things that's ever happened to me. So I went to talk to her. Let me tell you what she told me. And again, in talking with her, I had referenced the gospel and her position in Christ things of this nature. Here's what she said. Now listen close, because you're not going to believe that you're hearing me right. 
what she told me, she said, Brother Kyle, she said, uh, I listened closely to what you were saying. And she said, I wanted them to get saved that day when you were there in the hospital. She said, but now that my husband's gone, I cannot accept Christ. Now that part of it's not, it's the next part. So then she told me, she said, I cannot now that my husband is dead, I know where he's at. And she said, I cannot betray him and receive Christ. She said, I feel so guilty that I cannot ask Christ to save me now. I know that I have to spend eternity with him in hell. I, uh, I talked with her. She continued to come to church on and all for about another five years. But she never changed her position. We need to understand that Satan has an ability to deceive and that there's not a person, I realize I'm not talking about as far as losing salvation, but I just want you to understand there's not a person here that is not susceptible to his deception. We need to understand that. Say, so, well, what can I do? How can I avoid his deception? It's through truth. It's the Word of God. It's the power of a holy God. Everything that God says is true, and everything that Satan says is a lie. Amen. It may sound close to the truth. Close ain't good enough. Right. Father, we come to you tonight. Thank you, Lord, for this time that you've given us together. God, we thank you, Lord, for your Word. God, for for its perfect standard. God, I pray, Lord, that we would each and every one have a hunger to read and study and to meditate. God, I pray that we would have a burden, that you would give us a burden, Lord, for, for people, for people that you put on our heart by name that we need to share your son with. Dear God, there, there are people, Lord, in all likelihood that we will see before the sun goes down that are headed to hell. And oh God, I pray, Father, dear God, that, that, that we not just get to the point where that doesn't bother us. There'll be one here tonight this long. Dear God, I know it's just home folk to you. But God, there'll be one here tonight to see I pray, Father, your Holy Spirit to speak to their heart and show them, God, that it's hopeless apart from you. And that they must recognize their guilt, their sin. But even as they do so, Father, I ask that you put your arm around them and tell them, God, that you love them. And that if they will, by faith, believe that Jesus Christ died in their place as their substitute to pay a price that they could not pay would repent of their sin Father, would call upon you for salvation and ask you God to forgive them of that sin God you make us a promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved Father you know every heart here God I pray that we would simply Lord, see our hearts Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.